Good morning and welcome to Most of the View, Maternal Musings with Jenny B and Friends. I'm Jenny B and this morning I'm so happy to be here with Ilana Grostern who is self-attunement coach and somatic coach and happens to be my coach as well. How are you doing this morning? I am doing fantastically. I'm being very happy when this humidity lifts though because I know that every time I talk or go into session with somebody and it's just a little bit warm that suddenly start sweating like crazy and I have to figure out to what extent that is a function of my nervous system. But other than uh -huh. that, just getting, being soaked in sweat shortly, I am great and very happy to be here again. Wonderful. So we're a few kilometers away from each other and I'm not having a humidity issue up here. I'm actually so chilly in my apartment. I'm wondering if it's time to put the heat back on. What? Really? But, uh, yeah, it gets cool. cold up here in the Laurentians. Okay, um, nice, nice shirt for anyone Thank listening you. and not Thank seeing. You. There's a purple shirt with a with a womb on it. This is fantastic. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to wear this T-shirt. It's for these conversations. In fact, I might wear them for every conversation. That <laughs> Wonderful. So people are joining in live. Just know that you can uh, type a comment if you have questions for Elena or if you have anything that you want to share. Um, so it's really meaningful uh, for me that Elena is here today. Um, on the show. It's been about a year since I've not put out a Wombs with View show. Um, and I think the last guest that I actually had mm -hmm. on, funny enough, was Ilana a year ago, uh, a series of unfortunate events, whatever happened in my life. Um, uh, I got to the point where really it came down to um, nervous system uh, I call it a spaz. I feel like my nervous system had spazzed out and I was not in a place to uh, interact or share and certainly not in a place to come on and interview people um, in this capacity. But after the last year and Ilana being a big part of coaching me and supporting me through that, I am starting to uh, feel very much like myself and I'm so happy to be back here to talk about exactly that subject, not necessarily as it applies to me and my nervous system, but everybody's nervous system. And um, so maybe Elena, I'll let you describe a little bit what we're planning for the next few uh, few weeks ahead. Okay, sure. So uh, what I, I want to approach the nervous system, we're going to overlay what we're going to do or hope to do is overlay the nervous system on parenting ultimately, because that's what your show is uh, mostly relating to, but also my, my strong feeling is that if we go through the paces of life uh, and we're lacking information, it's inf about how we are and how our how our body functions. It's infinitely harder to make sense of how we are in the world. So it's what I do in my role as a coach mostly is to help individuals find the missing bits of information about themselves, just only so that they don't have to work so hard to, to be them and to be well in the world. So... Just, I'm, we're not going to get technical about what the nervous system is. We're just going to talk about how it affects how we are and how much of how we are in the world is below consciousness. Uh, what I, I had asked on Facebook the other day if, if I tell you that most, like how you are is mostly determined by how your nervous system is. How does that make you feel? And I did get back from quite a few people relief, right? There's got to be, you know, when everyone's like, there's something wrong with me and it's incumbent upon me to figure out what that is. It makes being alive kind of a pass fail exercise when it's not that at all. So working the nervous system in understanding the design and the function of it, understanding um, the idea of maladjust, maladjusted behaviors it helps us to really stop blaming ourselves so much and start getting curious about why we are the way we are. So we're going to do a five part series. That's our plan. Uh, the, whatever comes out of this conversation will inform the next four, which Jenny and I will plan afterwards. But this one we're talking about co-regulation. Um, Jenny, do you want to tell us what you learned about co-regulation in your words? Oh, la la. There's so much. Um, there is so much that I've learned. Just knowing what that term means has been has been amazing for me in my own personal life and healing journey. But also in my life as a mom, uh, I have two children and I have one that is a lot like me and one that reacts and one's that one that nervous system is very similar to mine. And I can just see the I can see the path she's going on. And there was a moment where I felt really helpless in that. Um, and understanding co-regulation and being around people, including Ilana, um, who have helped me <laughs> co-regulate, I now am learning and doing very well uh, at helping my daughter, which is, it, 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 it's something that, I don't know, if you don't know what it is, 
how can I say? So for example, a kid has a meltdown and this could be a, a young child or it could be a you know pre prepubescent young woman. Um, and it can be triggering for parents. It can be triggering for me. Her fire meets my fire. And I kind of just want to yell at her to get out of my face and slam the door in her room. I, I mean, I don't do that, but I, I understand how that is a reaction um, that parents can have. And I can now think, okay, in this moment, when if I'm behaving like this, which I sometimes do, God bless the people who, <laughs> who help me, what do I need? I need a hug. I need to be held. I don't need to be yelled at in that moment. Um, so then I'm, I'm able to use what I've learned about myself to help her. And it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's phenomenal the effect that it has on when I calm myself, how I can then help her to calm herself. And I think that's what parents are supposed to do. Uh, unfortunately, most of us maybe did not have that kind of parenting. We grow up to become adults and we're still freaking out and don't know how to calm ourselves. Yeah. Well said, and I'm so happy it's making such a big difference for your daughter, especially at such a pivotal time in her life. So our nervous system is constantly receiving data from the world around us and using that data to decide how to respond or react. Uh, I'm sure uh, you for sure, but most of your viewers have heard about fight or flight, which is um, uh, it's, a, it's the way that your nervous system keeps you safe in the world. So in the face of a threat, it mobilizes energy very quickly to either get you to safety by running away or by fighting. Uh, you know, if you're if you are being if you can't run away from danger, then fighting is the appropriate response. Um, past that, if you you can't get away from danger, the nervous system will throw you into freeze, which is like a, a simulacrum of death. So, and then we'll bring you back online afterwards. And the, the problem in, in uh, 21st century living is that because of the, the nature of the world that we live in, we most of us are in constant fight or flight without being aware of it. Um, we're always on the defense. We're always feeling like our shoulders are hunched up. A lot of people speak of shoulder and neck pain, back pain, which is all as a result of being ready to fight or flight most of our uh, fight or flee for most of our lives so bring that into the parenting arena when you have kids uh, i remember my eldest daughter uh, similar to yours is very similar to, the, to my personality and from the moment that kid came out we were reacting to each other she was very very attached to me she never slept i couldn't put her down i was exhausted so we entered a, a very um reinforcing dynamic from the get-go uh and someone said to me, and I had, I've kept this in mind since she was an infant, she's almost 19 now, um, that she's just a jangly batch of nerves, like there's no mm -hmm. in the world around her. So that mm -hmm. was, it made me realize even at that point, although not, not enough to counter what was going on in my own uh, body, that I had a role, I needed to safeguard that jangly bundle of nerves and, and to allow her to grow up. Uh, and that child was from a very young age and continues to receive data streams from like input from the world around her at a much higher than usual rate. So reacts to everything all the time. And I have some degree of that as well. And I was receiving her information and her need for me and not able to kind of get away from that and feel safe ever. So because she was looking to me, now this is, this is what the attun attunement part of self attunement for in my practice, it's learning to read your own signals, but attuning to another person means being able to pick up on what they're feeling in any moment and respond accordingly, not react. So when a kid is in distress, you know, they turn to the parent for comfort because they're looking to be shown how to come out of fight and flight and calm down. They're, their nervous systems are looking to our nervous systems to, un to learn how to react, respond appropriately to threats in the environment. Their nervous systems rely on our nervous systems to know that they're safe. But if we are constantly in fight and flight and we are constantly like the world is a dangerous place, we raise children who think that the world is constantly a dangerous place as well. So why are rates of anxiety and depression so high? You know, why do kids have so many problems in school? nervous systems that are um that are not able to what's called down regulate come out of fight and flight states into just calm so the thing that parents don't realize which i think you which you spoke to is that it has to be us first we have to learn to regulate ourselves which means bring ourselves into a state of calm where we can 
stop, assess for danger, and be realistic, if any exists. You know, in the absence of, we're, we're living in this society where we don't, we're not, we don't actually ever have to worry about a bear coming for us. And, and here in Montreal, anyways, you know, there's low rates of violence. I'm not talking about domestic violence, but, you know, you're unlikely, it's not unlikely you're going to walk down the street and somebody's going to jump you. The odds are very low. So we're rel we're living in relative safety here, body wise. We have I coyotes here, Ilana. There are coyotes that I hear at night. Like no bears. Much <laughs> Actually, there's coyotes here. A few kilometers north. <laughs> there's, there's, there's coyotes here too, apparently, and wild turkeys. Uh, and my dog, right? So, so walking through the world with a, a nervous system that's designed to keep us safe from predators requires the mind to get involved and create the um, an idea that we're always right for being preyed upon. You know, our nervous system is going to nervous system, no matter what. It is up to us to start really questioning Am I actually safe or am I not safe? And do the work. That's what that's what you and I have been working on together is being able to distinguish between actual threats to our well-being on any level and a, what's a product of our conditioning and what we're used to and what we really we what we're um we're programmed to believe. So it's critical for the parents to do that work of coming into regulation within themselves and the only other the only way to do that is with another adult. To do it properly it has to be somebody who's kind of on the same level as you so um you know for those of us who are lucky enough to have parents who we can co we've always co-regulated with not me by the way uh or you uh you know we can turn to a parent we have to be very selective about our partnerships and how they make us feel in our bodies on that level if we're constantly defending against the other person in the partnership they're not somebody we can co-regulate with we can't be well we pass that on to the kids it can be a best friend it can be a professional to find somebody who, when you stand around near them, you notice a deep calm in your body, and you you notice you can think logically and rationally. That that's the that's the the best sign that you are regulated is that your thoughts are in the present moment. You're not constantly spinning off into the future and drasticizing and catastrophizing and ruminating about things. That's a sign of a dysregulated system. It's constantly doing that. So. You know, sometimes you'll notice when you mention needing a hug. What's your experience when you get a hug? What do you notice in your body? Well, I suppose it depends on who the hug is from, right? But if we're if we're, <laughs> if we're uh, hugging a regulated person, um, I, I assume for the for the most part, it it's a calming, it's a release or a relief. Um, I mean, and that can be when we're in a state of feeling anxious or scared or whatever it is, or it can be just greeting a friend. When you greet that friend and you haven't seen them in a while and you give them a big hug, there's a sigh, your whole body, <sighs> a sigh of relief. Yeah, right? Yeah, that whole like letting go of the tension kind of thing. And afterwards, um, I took part, uh, Kristen Sari here in, in Montreal. She's a wonderful dancer and a teacher. And uh you know, during uh, towards the end of the lockdown, she organized this beautiful event called the Embrace, which was uh, it was kind of like a performance piece to an extent, but it was it was a response to the separation we'd all been feeling. Which and we gathered in public, and we did it three or four times. And for thirty minutes, it was a circle of strangers, didn't know each other, and we stood in long embraces for th thirty seconds while we experienced that co-regulation. And I don't have a lack of regulated people in my life or a lack of touch, but the experience coming out of that, the peace, there was even a little bit of elation, there was calm, the world seemed safe and wonderful, and the colors were brighter and more brilliant. Mm -hmm. There was really, she knew what she was doing intuitively, even if didn't, she didn't overlay it with the neuroscience of it. But, you know, it was, it was adult people entering into this uh, um, mirroring of nervous systems with the intention to offer wellness to the other person. And I think that was the most intense uh, and concentrated experience of co-regulation. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, so if, if those get started up again, I do invite so, but, you to join. So, but to what degree is that healing? Like, so I kind of started off talking about when a child is in a crisis and then we need to calm, calm that child, we become calm, we calm. But, but, but I mean, it's not like, okay, kids screaming run off to embrace go hug some regulated adults then come back and calm your child like it's not that we need to get to a state where in right. general our nervous system is calm so yeah. what is what is kind of the recipe of 
becoming regulated adults via another regulated adult in order to transmit that around. So the first thing I will say, I, I'm just wondering if you've noticed this, because when I figured out with my own daughter, and actually it was only like two years ago, what the heck was going on. So we had a lot, mm. we had 16 years of dysregulation before she and I were able to figure out what was happening. When you are regulated within yourself, and that's the commitment to noticing what's going on in here first, your child picks it up. So you might notice the child themselves having far fewer crises because our, our children are, are, their nervous systems are designed to attune to ours. So if we are off and spending most of our time off, it throws them off. So that's mm -hmm. the number one thing. The, the, the commitment to your own regulation is a commitment to their regulation, first and foremost. We go through ourselves first to heal our children. So it is. It, it's the question was um, specifically what the process is. First of all, we have to notice the signs of dysregulation in ourself and commit to. Could you name some of that for people watching? Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I'm sure most of most of the moms can or the parents on here can um, can sympathize. I just I'm, just, I'm having this flashback to, uh, you know, when my kids were a lot younger and I was still in the marriage it didn't very much suit me. I would these ra blind rage moments where I'd throw things and I could see myself doing it. All I could connect with was how good it felt in that moment to let out that energy. I, one time I flung a spatula and it was like a cheap one from Dollarama and it broke apart and lodged itself in the wall above the cupboards as if it was like ax throwing kind of thing. I never threw at anybody else. It's just, I had to discharge this fight or flight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm going to, I want to actually um, point out, uh, that rage that a lot of, of I know mothers, but when we snap and yell and we get enraged, that is not anger. That's anxiety building up in the body. That is hypermobile mm. hyper light energy that we have to discharge. And we can't run away mostly because we have small children and we'd be accused of abandonment. So instead we yell and scream because that energy, when the nervous system says you're not safe right now, go, it can't do that. The next thing was going to be flight, a fight rather. And so that's, that's the fight energy that's coming out. I mean, so. and and certainly, and this is maybe a topic for a future show, but the, the way that women in uh, new moms are perpetually exhausted, throw mm -hmm. in a second kid. I mean, we have talked about this before. When you're nursing two young children and changing diapers and you never have any relief, mm -hmm. your your whole system, all of your systems are are completely out of whack. You're exhausted. You're sleep deprived. There's, there's no, there is no rest and digest time. There's no, there's no time to do yeah. that. So we're constantly on edge and that for many of us, myself included, thank you for normalizing the throwing <laughs> small objects in the air. I've been there before <laughs> too. Ever. Yeah. I'm just saying that's, that's a social failure. And so most, most uh, nervous system states, including depression and anxiety, are a reflection of social ills. And so this is a much bigger topic. Mm -hmm. um, how do we fix that? Total social overhaul. We need to be living back in small communities. We need our mothers and our sisters and, you know, the, the community around us to give us breaks. Uh, so that's the or one of the origins of the problems and throw on top of that the world that we live in today. But past that, it's, I think, my practice is really focused on noticing you know we've the, the moment that you move out of calm into activation that's the moment you can do something and that's the moment you can start connecting your mind with your body and changing the patterns so you know uh, i remember working with um a mom once who was could not stop reacting to her teenage daughter and we worked with noticing what she was like i just i go right into yelling at her the second she comes in the room so we worked with her to notice the cues that she was about to lose control. And it was every, she, she through reenacting, you know, through our coaching session, we, we put her into a very calm state. We imagined the, the daughter coming into her room, her hands clenched into fists and she hadn't noticed that was happening, mm -hmm. right? So that's like, I'm ready to fight this kid who's coming in. That is a, it's symptomatic of a system that's uh, is priming to fight. So she had to, remember that that was what was going to happen and open her hands and cue her whole nervous system to come down to remember she's in the present moment. This is her child who she loves. She's not actually a threat, but they had such a history of 
competing for space that both of them were on high alert every time she walked into the room. So there, there's a number of things that have to happen. First, we have to learn how to recognize uh, safety in another nervous system. That's that's the most challenging thing, because as you know, in partners, in people, we tend to be attracted to uh, people who behave like our parents did, because that is what is familiar to our nervous system. So we, we've talked we talked about this, we've commented on posts on the internet that like that butterflies, we could be a good feeling or could be anxiety because your nervous system is saying this person is off, you know, and when we get very precise and we start to really notice through um, committed work, what an, a calm nervous system feels like, what, how does, what, what it, how easy it is to stay calm in the face of another regulated person right away. We notice when somebody is off and we protect ourselves against that. We don't say, we don't surpass our own limits and our own boundaries and say, well, it must be me. There's, I'm sure this person is fine. Everybody says they're fine. No, if you are, your nervous systems are incompatible, then there's not a whole lot uh, off the bat. There's not a whole lot that can be done without causing yourself more dysregulation. And, um, and, and that's could, that, could that simple feeling, like, I think actually the last show that you were on, we were talking about uh, intuition like for me, just what you're saying is like you have an intuitive thought when you're around a person for the first time, if that yeah. is a, a good yeah. vibe or not that you yeah. want to be on. So, so the thing we call intuition or gut feeling is all nervous system stuff. I mean, we there's, there's a lot, you know, we're not, I'm not talking about people who like to see things or intuit or whatever. But when you have a gut feeling about a person, chances are it's bang on. When you can learn to... Um, to, to navigate people through your gut, you'll know very quickly who you're talking to. The mind will cre will like will ask you to ignore all those things, but when you can learn to be gut first, and you know my, the whole premise of the work that I'm doing is called body first living, which is use your body as the barometer to to read signals from people and from environments to know you're safe because it knows right away, yes or no, safe or not safe. You know, it's, so it do you do you think? Sorry, I'll take this off on it. I hear the train yeah. in the background at your place. I feel like I'm going on another train here. Um, but could it not be that many people, certainly if they've been living with deregulated nervous system for a certain amount of time, can't feel that? We can't feel those danger signs. I think uh, that yes. I mean, yes. That that's a big part of it. It's a, you know, you and I have been working together for a while that we've had to really nuance over time as you learned how your system works, as we brought you down more regularly into regulated states from, we had to, we, the first thing that has to happen with a nervous system that's been in chaos for a long time is that it has to learn to be okay, not in activation. That's the first thing. So, so I, for me to say to somebody, trust your gut, who's like, but I've been in abusive situations my whole life. No, it's not possible. We have to give them an, another experience of themselves that they have something to compare to. They have to remember what it was like to feel safe. And that's in the, you know, the, the default of the nervous system is safety. It gets programmed over time to be very hyper reactive. So it, it, over, over time, we learn how to be that way. But I think even people who have been in chronic chaos their whole life, if, I, if they're okay to being touched and somebody they really trust wraps them in a bear hug, they know the difference between, you know, how they feel with mm -hmm, safe mm -hmm. around them. And that, and that's the place we have to remember to operate from. And we do that over time. So it's, it's a process. I mean, we're talking about a complex process, you know, how, how do we change the parenting game? Ultimately, how do we improve our relationships with our children and everybody in our lives? We commit to it, number one. We commit to noticing when we're about to go off. We commit to dialing back, step, you know, to doing, you know, 1% less reacting over time, seeing where the choices are, where the options are, and moving us back into, uh, into a regulated state. And any work we do on this affects our children. It's not, this is not a pass-fail exercise. It's just being better at managing our reactivity. And that doesn't mean top down shaming ourselves. It means bottom up uh, sensitizing ourselves to what our bodies are saying. So in that moment that you're like, I, I keep coming back to this idea of like, you know, you see these typical things on, on in movies or whatever, anger management and the idea of counting to 10. Um, that doesn't seem so far off what you're talking about. It seems like, what do we do? We're in this moment where we're particularly, we're, we're possibly going to be triggered by our kid who's yelling or crying or whatever thing that they're doing. What do we do? We take a deep breath. 
we remember that bear hug and then we proceed from a place of calm? Is that is that a... What I work on is signals from the body, okay? Because when you're in survival mode, there's no creative capacity. We can't remember. There's just a procedural memory, which is very automatic. You know, it's designed... This is an example of this. If you're st- you're about to step off a curb and a car comes whizzing by, you might find yourself back on the curb with no memory of how you got mm-hmm. there. That's mm-hmm. the memory will just, you know, the body will act. So the fight or flight states put you into mindlessness, which means you you can't be rational or logical. You can't step back in that moment when you're activated and say, this is just a little baby. It's not a bear coming to kill me. It's my child who I love so much. It's such a... Um, it's such a deeply programmed response, fight or flight, that to ask yourself to be rational or logical in that moment is just an opportunity to shame and blame. So what that's what I do is we we te- like with this woman who clenched her fists, you know, is you have to notice the first the, the, the commitment to checking in with the body and remembering you have a body um, is the way to do it. Because the body, the, the nervous system is actually rooted in the here and now, whereas the mind is telling you about past, uh, past and future, right? So what is happening now in this moment? And this is something we have to practice over time. So the baby starts to cry. You're, you're sitting, okay, you're like, the, you're, you put the baby down for a nap and you're like, oh, I have an hour time to myself. All right, I'm going to sit and read a book or be on my phone with no interruptions. Put the baby down five minutes after the baby starts to cry and you go, <gasps> There's so much happening in that moment. Number one Mm is I have to go put the baby back to sleep. Then there's also the disappointment that you finally, that time you were so looking forward to, you know, you don't get it. Now it's, you know, it's it's whittling away at your time. So, but there's something happening in the body, which is often (gasps) kind of thing, or there's something that's a tension that's happening. So for people who are listening, Ilana's clenching her teeth, that typical, that typical, oh my God, a bear's coming. Her bum cheeks are probably pretty squeezed <laughs> together too. She's oh. got her traps up near her ears. Her eyes are bulging. There's yeah. a bear, I'm but it's not red. a bear. Oh, it's not <laughs> a bear. It's my sweet little baby who I love so much, but who's driving me crazy, crying because I can't be without them. Uh, they can't be without me or they can't stay asleep for two minutes. So what we could do, and I've done this before when I've gotten, again, enraged, sometimes, you know, you go, you pick up the baby, you squeeze it a little too hard, like not that hard, but just like, you know, like there's there's a lot of energy that's mobilized in that moment just from hearing the baby cry. It's a program response because it's in that moment, the baby crying is a threat to your time. You're like, I have an hour to breathe and not be needed by anybody. You know, that is actually, it's it, there's it's life threatening on a, on a prolonged level to be constantly touched and and sucked and needed and to not have the space for yourself you know to not to not be able to get threats from that so the nervous system actually is responding in a way appropriately the actions that come after that are not appropriate for the you know for the the parent child dynamic so to be able to to with the baby's crying to notice you've clenched up and then count to 10 well maybe you don't have 10 but just breathe let out the breath <gasps> and cue your body back into it's okay, I can solve this problem. That's creating a bridge between the mind and the body where the stories can't run away with you quite as easily about this isn't fair, I didn't sign up for this, why is nobody helping me, I'm all alone, I hate parenting, whatever the thoughts are that come with that. Yeah, then you're in your head. So it's making me think, we've done this exercise together before and with my background as a yoga teacher, I mean, it's a cliche thing where the teacher says, feel the four corners of your feet on the ground rooting, you know, like a tree, all this stuff. It's not blah, blah, it's very real that when you are so in the head and you bring the energy and focus down to your feet touching the earth, Mm -hmm. We then can ground our energy, get out of the head, get back into the body and be in a more calm space to to move from there. I mean, all these um, co-opted mindfulness practices come from very wise, uh, ancient uh, practices designed to regulate a person, you know, to remember Mm -hmm. that life is lived in the here and now, not in the past or the future. Your body is the um, is the the through your body is the best way to remember that you're not in danger. And is this, the, uh, the problem with the, with the, like the yoga and the mindfulness practices is that they tend not to be practical. Like they're not, you do it while you're in the class, but you can take those same mm. practices mm-hmm. and apply them to real life and learn to regulate yourself 
you go back, you pick up that. So say the same, same situation, baby's crying, you're interrupted and you go back and you're like, you stupid little baby, whatever it is you're thinking, like, I, I don't want this, whatever. Is that baby going to go back to sleep? Like it's picking up that you don't like it. Well, much. they feel, they might not hear your words, but they feel every vibration coming out of your body. And when it's one of, of frustration and anger, they yeah. they feel that. I mean, I, I even am curious of the subject of what they feel what they feel while they're in the womb before they even arrive here and how that affects how that affects their understanding of the world around them exactly they're, as they, they are, come they're, onto they're, this planet they're fused to us in an energetic way like in terms of transmission of data and they because they have to be they cannot survive without us but they don't have <laughs> <laughs> This is this is again, but I was thinking this as I was cuddling. So I have two. I never thought I would love cats, but I, I mean, half the week I don't have my kids with me, and I'm in my apartment alone, and I talk to my cat. I love these cats, and this Those particular cats one are co-regulating with you exactly. But that was my question. I was I was in bed, and I had one on my over top of my head, and then this this one sleeping across my neck, and I could just feel them purring, and I was I I was just feeling like maybe I don't know anything about this animal company you know when people have um rest what do you call them uh oh, the emotional uh, support emotional support like it must be this so so we can get the good cozy vibes off of the animals just as the much right as animals. the right animals I the have right animals I yeah dog, I, I see your posts about your your dogs that seem actually quite annoying yeah but. yeah no those are not <laughs> <laughs> was we got that dog for an emotional support animal from her. Oh, okay. And what she's okay. Done is her, all of her, her anxiety somehow. That's what the trainer And says. they will deregulate, but they will deregulate. Yeah. I actually babysat my friend's dog, who was this adorable, cute Pomeranian, but she made me, she made me way crazier oh, yeah. than I needed to be that these, week. She was ripping up dogs. pieces of paper and. Yeah. No, my dogs are dysregulating now, the entire household. I love them, but I've had cats and I'm like, mm, yeah, my cat comes, sits on my chest, purrs. I can actually I'll fall asleep if I sit and listen to her doing that for long enough. So it was just back to finishing up. Like if you go to that baby that's crying because it's alone by itself and needs you to help it go back to sleep. And then you come with the energy of mm -hmm. screw you, mm -hmm. you know, or if you take versus if you take a moment to take a breath, come back into the present moment and go to that baby, that baby is the baby is much more likely to go back into sleep. If it's not picking up that there's something wrong there. So mm -hmm. that's with an infant. Take your 12 year old daughter who's like, ah, some, you know, I'm not sure how to handle this new experience in my body, this is a sensation in my body or something that's happening with a friend. And you come back and you say, and you come back and you come to that instead of getting caught up in her um, anxiety and her agitation, you take a moment to center yourself and come to her very grounded. She will be able to come back into regulation very, very quickly and you can think through the problem together. The message that you're sending her is, I'm here to help you, I have your back, I trust you, let's, let's, you know, you can keep yourself safe and I'm gonna teach you how to do that. You know, and it also- And again, it's a, it's a constant, it's not a, okay, we do this one time and then it's our always, kids are fixed forever. Yeah, we go no. hug that one bear and we're fixed for, it is like a daily work and practice mm -hmm. and as you say, yeah. commitment to, to yeah coming back but over time you know like i spent 16 years trying to figure out what was wrong with what was wrong with my daughter and what was wrong with our relationship i don't have to think about this stuff anymore because once we figured mm -hmm. out this critical aspect of it we became another mm -hmm. ver the version of of our relationship that we always wanted to because we would notice the set and we'll do it very quickly like and and I can I can see it's coming. And the, the funny thing is, if my daughter says a thing, this daughter says a thing to me right away, I go into. <gasps> whereas if either of my other daughters say the exact same thing, I'll just be like, "Ha ha, that's so cute, right?" So there's like mm -hmm. so many things, illogical things happening below the surface. They say the exact same words, the exact same criticisms lobbed at me, and one I'm just like, like look at them making that face. The bear's coming for me again. And the other one I'm just mm -hmm. like patting her on the head and, and kind of laughing at how ridiculous it is. You know? It's so, incredible. Eh? I get those comments from, from both of my, I mean, I think every kid thinks you love the other kid more than you love them. I, I get that. You love Arlo more than me. It's not that Arlo does not trigger me the way that you do because, because it's that mirror image of like, you know, with the, the children we have that are so similar to us. Mm -hmm. And from what I've seen, it's often like girl, girl, you know, mother, daughter, yeah father son kind of thing we see the parts of us reflected back in us that yeah. we don't necessarily yeah. want to see 
and then we don't see it, we feel. Well said, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that, that's the thing that's so below our consciousness. And, we, mm -hmm. and that's it, when we can remember that, that there are forces at work that are by design, they serve a function always, and the maladjustment means that they're, they're kind of glitching or being used in the wrong capacity, then we can say, okay, it's not my fault, but it is my responsibility to figure out how to do things differently. And that's where mm -hmm. this work is so important. This is the, I really truly feel that our responsibility as parents is to learn how to find the, find the spaces and the partnerships and the therapists and the coaches who can help us come experience, remember what it's like to feel regulated in ourselves, learn the tips and tricks and the tools that work for us to bring us back into the present moment so we can proceed rationally. And um, and the motivation for that, as I said, is not just that we feel better in the world, but we it's up to us to teach our kids how to be in the world. This is generational. This is this is a generational commitment because it's it's intergenerational and it's and it's society, right? Like from I, I remember again training as a, a yoga therapist and learning about the immune system, the, the nervous system, the um, you know, the, and then it felt like trauma and trauma. Um, therapy, it felt like these were all buzzwords. And I was kind of like, oh, give me a break. Not everyone is traumatized. But <laughs> I've realized that, especially after these last two years of bullshit, <laughs> the whole world is traumatized. Yeah, oh. And the whole world is, is still has, we have no idea how we're, how the generations that just got masked up and, and locked down for, for no reason with no scientific backing, mm. we don't, we don't yet know how that, how those kids are going to come out of those traumas or if they will ever be, you know, when will they be re uh, recognized as trauma? So I, I think probably the vast majority of human beings on the planet are walking yeah. around with trauma. So no, it's not just the people who uh, witnessed their brother getting hit and killed by by a bike when they were a child. We're we're constantly tra we're constantly traumatized and living with these. Um, you know, I learned from you the the term complex post traumatic stress disorder. It's like we we grow up with constant even like microaggressions through the, through the day that we never deal with or we never have that space to recognize it as abusive or neglect or trauma. But most of us, to a certain degree, are are from day one being mm -hmm. constantly traumatized. So. <laughs> Our current understanding, and this is Gabor Mate's work largely, and then quite a few other people, uh, Peter Levine of Somatic Experiencing as well. There's there's two different kinds of trauma. You mentioned the complex PTSD, which is a series of microaggressions over time that kind of train the nervous system. There's shock trauma, like war or um, an accident kind of thing. Um, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, <laughs> Oh yeah, um, what, what trauma we understand is is the in in the moment when the thing occurs, whatever it is, it's that we can't discharge that fight or flight energy, so it gets kind of stuck in our bodies and creates patternings in our bodies. So you know the the discharge aspect, which we could maybe talk about that in one of our other sessions about how critical it is to if that fight or flight energy is mobilized, which it happens in a heartbeat. You know, it's just like the baby cries. <gasps> that there's a discharge of energy, it has to go somewhere. If we keep it in and it builds up in our tissues and our and our muscles and our pattern responses, it leads to chronic illness. It leads to acute illness, it leads to chronic illness, it is the origin of a lot of disease in the human body. Um, and you know, the the lock the 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 responses of the last two years preyed on the fact that people were already in hypervigilance mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and in dysregulation mm -hmm. and maladjustment. It's the only reason that things were able to proceed as they did is because everybody was primed and already in fight or flight or freeze. So, you know, it's- And then the, the effect understanding how important that co-regulation co with other adult yeah. humans is yeah. and yeah. how we were all isolated and separated. It yeah. was kind of the perfect recipe. Yeah. And like some of us saw that coming a mile away and said, no, sorry, we're not gonna, we're not giving up this thing that we need, which is other people. That's what mm -hmm. keeps us well in the world. And I saw this from a different point of view. And, you know, not not to say that we're not traumatized, we're just, we, we came through this with our humanity attack, uh, attack. humanity intact, not attacked. Mm -hmm. our humanity mm -hmm. was attacked, what we came through with the humanity. Well attack, said. Because yeah. we have to be with other humans in order to be well. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. it, we all end up. And by being with other humans, adults with adults, creating the space 
that's the that's the default. The baseline is adults in adult community and the kids coming in kind of a satellite to that. Because our kids should never have to co-regulate us. And a lot of us look to our children to do that. And that's called parentalization. And it creates a lot of psychological problems. Mm -hmm. the long -term. I have goosebumps. We have we have more of these conversations right. to uh, to come into in the next couple of weeks. Um, thank you so, so much. I want to put up your website and invite anyone uh, who is interested. So that year ago when we were speaking and things were getting weird for me and Ilana hinted like, oh, you know, you can come see me for a coach. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I didn't get it. I didn't get to it for months. Um, uh, but it, uh, working with you, Elena has been life changing. Like you've saved my ass so much in so many ways. You've been an incredible support. And I know, um, uh, yeah, she does not call herself a therapist, but when I talk about yes. her, I, I say, I say, oh, I've got, I've got therapy in half an hour, but really I'm meeting. This, with is, how, this is how coaches end up getting sued and not being allowed to practice yeah. anymore. We do yeah. not do therapy. We do somatic coaching, uh, but it is therapeutic. We can agree it's that it's yes, incredibly that therapeutic. Yeah. yeah we yeah. engage and in I'm, a lot of philosophical conversation as well. We engage the mind, you know, that's over that it's in the present moment. It's a full, and I am though, I just want to ask one more question and I, I know probably the answer to it. It's definitely how I feel. It's how I felt again since the yoga therapy training. When it when it comes to trauma, do you think, Ilana, that it's possible to heal trauma just through talk therapy or because we store trauma so deeply in the body, we need to get more into the somatic sphere? Yeah, that um, the mind, figuring out the functions of the mind can probably take us about 75% of the way there. If we do not loop in the body, then we're not, we can never be firing on all pistons. So um, it's critical. I mean, the, the whole function of the somatic approach, somatic is the soma, which means the whole being, which is mind, body, soul. And everything and they all have to enter into communion with each other we have to have to have to learn to reinterface the mind and the body because our entire society invalidates and um signaling from the body and causes us to disavow uh you know most of where our data comes from about how we are in the world so you know as everyone who's like i have done all the things i'm like no nah, you haven't <laughs> like we, we haven't talked mm -hmm. about the body and also really the um the uh, the imperative for the nervous system is not to do more, it's to do less. And this is what we really need to, maybe we can actually, that could be, an, that would be a really good next topic is do less to be more. All right, so in, in two weeks time, we'll be back Wednesday do morning, 9 a.m. Exactly. Yeah, wonderful. No, no, no. It's uh, again, like I remember in the first coaching sessions, like I wanted to kind of walk away with a to-do list of like, okay, what things do I need to do to feel better? And Ilana's thing was, you don't need to do more, you need to do less. Yeah. You need to be in a space where you have, and and th the banana bread, this was the, a reoccur, I might actually bake tomorrow, Ilana. Yeah. It was this thing of like, I, I had a coworker bring some banana bread and I was like, wow, like dude had time to bake banana bread. And he's a new dad, so he, you know, maybe he didn't really have the time, but I was like craving, I was craving the time to do something like baked banana bread and i was i was looking forward to the time when i could be bored and just yesterday in the coaching session with ilana that was what came up wasn't it yeah. and i was like i i don't have to do anything until tomorrow morning i have the rest of my day to be bored and i was like you yeah. have arrived yeah. <laughs> you have it's done the thing to be bored right <laughs> the fact you're like this is an option Mean. But again, that's the that's the rest and digest that we often yeah. don't don't again prioritize because we're we need to do 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 we need to go and do the things and yeah. there's always something there is always something to do but not prioritizing resting whether yeah. we're a brand new mom who needs to phone in the support of a postpartum doula or somebody with older kids who are half the time not even there we still need the the time to rest if we yeah. um if we want to be okay. Yeah, and it's uh, we have to give ourselves permission to rest as well. But, uh, yeah. And there you go. We have 
do do less to be more and permission to rest. We got our next two shows lined up. Thank you so, so much, Ilana. It's always a pleasure. I uh, will let you, you get on with your day. Thank you everybody for watching live. And for those of you who will uh, watch this on the repeat, please feel free to write comments and, uh, and questions and we will get back to you there. And uh, again, if you want to book a time or check out what Ilana is up to, you can go to her website, ilanagrostern.com. And um, thank you so, so much. We'll see you in a thank couple of weeks. Jenny. Speak to you soon. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.